Hello, I'm Professor David Berman from Queen Mary University of London and I'm going to talk to you about the building blocks of the universe. What are the building blocks? What makes up this incredibly complex universe around us? And also, how did we discover what these building blocks are? So it's a complex world with many different things that make up a whole load of different materials that surround us. The air that you breathe, the wood of a table, the metal that conducts electrons through wires that drive your computer. These are all very different things. And yet, we have the question, how many fundamental building blocks do we need to make all of this things up together? Well, what's the answer to that? is dependent upon how small you want to look. How small should your fundamental building blocks be? The idea goes all the way back to the Greeks, who had this notion that there were elementary things that built up everything around them. For the Greeks, this was just some simple notions of earth, wind, fire and water. But modern science found a way of determining what these building blocks really were. So, first, let's look at the periodic table. The periodic table is a table which organizes together different so-called elements. And the elements distinguish themselves by having different chemical properties. They would react with each other in different ways. And each one of these would have a different mass. So what people discovered is that you could organize all these different elements together into periods and groups where various elements would share similar chemical properties. And also, there was a very clear way in which elements will get more heavier and heavier as you went up the table. One question remained though, which is, why this table? Why this structure? Was there something deeper that made up these different elements with their different chemical properties that could explain the structure of the periodic table. To understand what makes the different elements in the periodic table different, we have to understand the idea of the atom. J.J. Thompson discovered that an atom was made up of both positive and electrically charged objects. So in fact, those elements were not elementary at all, but made up of a combination of positive and negative charges. What followed next was an attempt to understand how those positive and negative charges organize themselves inside each one of those elements. The first thing is, let's give some things names. Thompson called the negatively charged particle he discovered the electron. And then we had some positive charges, and we'll come to what they're called later. There were two differing ideas about what made up the atom, about how those positive and negative charges were distributed. One of them, called the plum pudding model, um, plum puddings were more popular back then, was that the electric and positive charges were just evenly distributed, um, much like plums inside a pudding or something which became known as the nuclear model, that where you'd have a central nucleus, much like a sun, with the negatively charged objects orbiting around it, like the planets. That was called the nuclear model. And with these two competing ideas, it came down to experiment to work out how you could tell them apart. This experiment was done in Manchester by Geiger and Marsden. And what they did was to take gold leaf, which they could make super incredibly thin, so that it was basically one atom thick, and then scatter a particle off it, called an alpha particle, and then through its scattering, work out whether the plum pudding model or the nuclear model was the reflection of reality. Was it the positive charges in the middle and the negative charges on the outside, or were the charges just evenly spread? 
you can see from this diagram that when we look at when we uh, scatter things from an atom, we can see that they scatter very differently depending on the model. In the plum pudding model, because everything is evenly distributed, then the charges sort of go through and slightly deflect. But if we have uh, the positive charges centralized in the middle, then when those other positively charged particles scatter, if it hits that middle bit, then they scatter very strongly. If it doesn't hit the middle bit, they don't scatter at all. That gives a very different scattering process. That was measured and people determined it was in fact the nuclear model of the atom that we're so familiar with now, of a nucleus in the middle that's positively charged and negatively charged electrons orbiting it. That was the atom. And we saw that we had this nucleus, this positively charged object in the middle. But that nucleus is itself made up of two sorts of elementary particle. The proton, which is positively charged, and in fact, its charge is equal and opposite of that to the electron, and the neutron, which is neutral and carries no charge. Both the proton and the neutron are much heavier than the electron. In fact, one proton is almost 2,000 times the mass of an electron. So most of the mass of our atoms comes from the nucleus. Now, let's go back to the periodic table and see if knowing something about atomic structure can tell us about how those elements are organized. First of all, all the atoms are neutrally charged, which means there's the same number of protons and electrons. The electrons will organize how things chemically bind and combine and determine the reactive properties of the element. So because the number of protons is the same as the number of electrons, in fact, the periodic table is organized by the number of protons that are live in the nucleus, which is called the atomic number. Hydrogen has one proton in the middle. Iron has 56 protons in the middle. But let's not forget the neutrons. The neutrons will actually make up almost half of the mass of the atom. But in fact, a given atom can have a different number of neutrons. And that's what different isotopes are. Different isotopes are something with the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. Let's look at our periodic table, and let's just look at some of the notation that we have. So the letter is the name of the element, and then the superscript, in this example, 12 for carbon, is the number of protons and neutrons added together. And then 6, the subscript, is the atomic number, the number of protons. And as you can see, the periodic table goes up in atomic number. And then you can look at the mass, and then you'll see that those masses is roughly the average mass as found in nature of the different isotopes of that element. Why are the neutrons there? What do they do? The protons, which are all in the nucleus, have the same charge. They would electromagnetically repel each other. What holds them there? If you just rely on the electromagnetic force, they certainly shouldn't be able to stay together. What the neutrons do is that they bind with the protons and each other using what is known as the nuclear force. The nuclear force is thousands of times stronger than the electromagnetic force, but actually only acts on very short distances roughly of the scale of a nucleus, which is why we've never seen it outside of a nucleus. So what they do, the neutrons, is they're needed in an atom to bind together the protons and overcome the electromagnetic repulsion and keep the nucleus stable. If you only have a few neutrons, the strong nuclear force isn't big enough to keep the protons together. We always need enough neutrons to keep the atom stable. What people do is plot 
the binding energy of the nucleus. And here we have a plot. What it tells us is that given a number of nucleons in the nucleus, that means the neutrons and protons together, how much binding energy there is. The more binding energy, the more strongly bound the nucleus is. The less binding energy, well, the less. <laughs> and it's got this very peculiar shape. It goes up very, very sharply from hydrogen and then curves round until it reaches iron and then starts to go down again until you go all the way up to uranium and the radioactive elements which are actually further down than the more stable iron. With the nuclear binding energy curve we can describe why and how we get energy from nuclear fission and nuclear fusion by the splitting or bringing together atoms. Let's first of all look at nuclear fission where we break apart a nucleus. Let's look on the curve at uranium-235. When we break it apart, we will climb the curve and that difference between where we have 235 nucleons or something like 120 will give us a difference in energy. And that binding energy then gets released as energy through radiation and heat. That's the thing which powers nuclear reactors and makes nuclear bombs. We also have another way. If we go all the way down to hydrogen and then go up along the curve to higher elements like helium, then what we will see is that again we get a release of binding energy. And that binding energy is what powers the sun. The amazing thing is from this curve, you can see why fusion is so much more powerful than fission. When we went from uranium all the way down to some lower elements, we gained quite a bit of binding energy. But just that huge jump from the binding energy of hydrogen to helium is enormous. And that's why many people believe fusion is the future for power. So far, we've seen that all of the material world is built from simple building blocks. The elements, and then inside the elements, explaining the periodic table, the atoms. And the atoms, protons, neutrons, and electrons. We've learned what makes them up, how they're organized, and then what binds the nucleus of the atom together, what binds the protons and neutrons. And finally, that there's a binding curve of energy, and that gives rise to fission and fusion. Now we're going to learn and see if there's anything more than protons, neutrons, and electrons. After all, they make up so much of the world around us, but what more have we found?